Yeah, welcome to everybody. We are ready to roll again. The busy season right here. Michael, you were not able to hold off the women nursery people, was it? Uh, well, so uh, J um, uh, um, Justin Bidwell is going to join us. Um, okay. He's yeah. He's and then uh, and then I kind of put behind the uh, upcoming meeting. Okay. That uh, we're going to have Jordan from Vreen's Nursery, okay. uh, from Sunstar Nursery. Sorry, okay. Uh, okay. Jordan from Sunstar Nursery, and then I hope to um, get a, an answer back from Tanya, uh, and she's going to hopefully show us a few pictures of what she saw in California at the okay. uh, at the cast at the California okay. trials. Yeah. Okay, okay. So okay. Th that that's my plan. All right, all right. Yeah. So then uh, I will start by. PowerPoint on the current problems, etc. Then uh, Michael will take over, and then we'll ask uh, Justin to log in, and uh, well, hopefully we will have a good uh, session again. As the program is recorded, all the recordings are on, on now in the same link now YouTube. So you could ask for it, or we could send you. So all, all the previous. Uh, Recording our recordings are available now on the same link. So everything is there now. And we plan to put the bedding plant workshop uh, proceeding as well sometime uh, towards the end of uh, June. Uh, just want to make a statement as well that uh, in our forum, uh, if any product we discuss or any recommendation we make, uh, generally it's not an endorsement of uh, a particular brand or something. Those are our own experience, our own knowledge, which we share with you. And then it's your own responsibility, the way you use them. Many times, uh, when we share our experience, the growers adopt it to great success. And if, uh, if due to some reason, um, the success is not there, what they're looking for, there are other reasons. Well, we cannot isolate one factor if there's a problem. For example, we cannot uh, put our finger on uh, uh, a particular fertilizer or nutrient and say, this is what did it. Uh, basically, uh, plot is a very integrated model. Uh, even if everything you are doing 100% perfect, if the pH is not right, your nutrient uptake will be uh, slowed down and a lot of problem will develop as a leaf spot. Uh, if there is a virus, for example, which are hidden and are, are, are spending quite a bit of time on different viruses as well, uh, Michael will also discuss two things and with that. And then uh, we cannot put our finger that is the virus doing it or like COVID virus. Uh, I had gone through last week through this COVID. My symptoms were uh, somewhat typical, but uh, I started getting very bad hiccup. And uh, I didn't blame COVID, <laughs> didn't blame COVID for that, but uh, didn't blame my wife for that. She didn't feed me. But uh, the message is that uh, uh, plants are multiple things are there your nutrient uptake, your watering practices, your pH, your salt level, what did you put in the growing media, what did you spray, your temperature day and night. Uh, uh, so I also noticed that uh, uh, sometimes growers uh, don't understand the basic physiology of the plant. For example, the, there should be the day temperature should be higher than the night temperature. Night temperature should be cooler than the day temperature because during the daytime, plants do what they do, the photosynthesis. They, they fix the sunlight and that's a temperature dependent thing. It should be the, uh, plus the solar energies there, which contribute towards the heat. But nighttime, plant use that stored energy. And if the temperature is the same as daytime, then uh, plant try to utilize all the energy it made just to keep it so cool. And that's not desirable. So nighttime, they carry out what we call respiration. And that respiration depends on is carried out at a three to four degree, five degrees cooler than the nighttime. And that's why plants work on a 24 hour average temperature. So you have a 12 hours of day, you combine at say 22 degrees centigrade, nighttime is 18, 
most of our bedding plots, we like to grow them about 80, but then for cooling, hardening, they go to a cold frame, five degrees, four degrees type temperature. But those are your petunias and pansies and other plants which go in that direction. Uh, geraniums don't like that cool temperature, they will turn purple. So my message is that uh, while diagnosing problems, uh, you cannot put your finger, oh, that's what they did. They're, even if that's the reason, the, there are the factors which need to be, because that's needed if we want to correct that problem. And that's what I like to uh, show you in my pictures. Well, and, and sometimes, Mirza, uh, somebody explains the symptoms and uh, forgets a detail. And that yep. might just be the, the detail that you needed to come to a different, uh, to a different uh, uh, solution or a different answer. Yep. Uh, because, yep. you know, so, so that's why pictures are so important because um, if, if you do want to diagnose something, uh, just the, the, um, the picture is just amazing because it'll, it, it, it says so much more than a description. And remember there was a time when uh, I was still working with the government. I had the freedom that if there's a problem, I will uh, drive over, have a look at it. And uh, but uh, the, that is becoming very limited now. You see, so uh, so we have to depend on digital means. So a good picture, good description, is highly desirable. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to go to the screen and start my. Okay, Michael, you can see it? Yeah, we can see it, Mirza. Great. Okay, my screen is hidden here. So I hope that everybody got those two pictures that uh, Mirza and I um, sent uh, yeah, as, a, as yeah, our yeah. uh, bi-weekly <laughs> pop quiz. So uh, we sent it through the, um, through the, through the greenhouse forum. We, uh, we sent yeah. two pictures. So whoever got those, those, yeah. Yeah, who, who check got those pictures, yeah. Yeah, check those pictures and put in the chat, please, what you think uh, they are. The one is a uh, petunia, the other one is a geranium. So if you said uh, the, the petunia, this is what I think the geranium is that, then we'll be able to hand out the, uh, the prize. Great, Michael, thanks for reminding me. That was a great idea. All right, so I will go through oh, some the question, of the issues. Oh, the question is, how do I get on the forum? So I'm gonna type in the chat, a phone number. Um, no, she needs the link or he needs the link? No, or? you need to be, it's, it's a closed group. And Debbie is the administrator. So there's her cell phone number. Uh, I'll, uh, what is it? Oh, how to get on the forum, okay. Yeah, you, you have to email her. Um, uh, and uh, she's the administrator and or email her or phone her and then uh, and then she'll add you to the group and then you will get all our messages uh, from um, you know the chats or uh, you know whatever else is going on somebody's got something to sell or a question or you know like we we've done like we've posted some pictures of uh, of things that are wrong and you don't know what it is and somebody else has the answer works pretty good Great, so uh, issues uh, brought to my attention and possible solution, LG and its control, LG is coming up pretty big now. And then use of hydrogen peroxide and other products like zero town. So that's my plan. Okay, all right. Uh, this was, uh, came in, uh, uh, the, the Veronica plugs, Michael, that's Veronica, is it? Mm, could be, it's a little up close, but uh, yeah. it could be something like that or, or um, yeah, it could yeah. be anything. Okay, so the, the girl sent me these pictures uh, after the last chat and these plugs came in with the powdery mildew. Uh, I mean, they are definitely crowded, no doubt about that, that's where they're supposed to be. And uh, so we, we did talk about in our last uh, chat as well, all these white spot is a fungus, is called powdery mildew. You know, that's what it looks like there. There are spots on the leaves. And so a few things about this fungus that very specific to their host. 
So the fungus which is growing on this plant, Veronica, or other, uh, say, cucumber, tomatoes, pepper, all have for the mildews, but they don't move from one, uh, so that one to the other. So that's what we mean, host specific. Doesn't infect from species to species, just their own species. So disease of high and low humidity, under low humidity condition, white powder will increase. Suddenly you will notice that uh, these spots are expanding very rapidly. That's a condition of stress, dry humidity condition, we used to call it a disease of uh, high ventilation where the mechanical fan used to be. Before these uh, ridge vented greenhouse, natural ventilation greenhouse came in, we, we still have fans. And when right where the fans were high, uh, high ventilation area, this fungus will come because it was very dry. You could see a path right there on the sides of the greenhouse where air was not moving that much, the problem was far less. So this is what happened. So it's interesting. It's interesting, Murs. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about uh, increasing air movement to, uh, to prevent uh, botrytis. Yeah. And uh, so I guess more is not better. Uh, you yeah, know, exactly. The, yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah the other things question, can happen. Yeah, it, the whole question is of humidity and the temperature, humidity, and the air movement is basically, the, the problem comes in that because of the air cannot move properly in these when, when, they're, when they're crowded. So under high humidity, the spores start germinating like botrytis, like gray mold. So then suddenly new spots on the new leaf, you will find uh, this fungus developing. And because as this fungus keep on growing, the leaves cannot do their photosynthesis where those parts are. So if the so food manufacturing capability of this plant is affected. So if they cannot make enough food, then the flowers will be weak, the plant will be weak. So so many things could happen. So under high humidity, new spots will develop. Sometime it can be washed off with water, you know, that uh, uh, we, we always, with cucumber tomatoes, we used to do, put some little bit of dishwashing soap, not the phosphor type, the other type, and as a surfactant, they will wash off, they'll be good for three, four days, and you could repeat it. So that, that is the other way to, those spores, once they fall on the floor or on the growing media, they are not able to germinate. Uh, sodium or potassium bicarbonate uh, at 0 0.5 gram per to one, 0 0.5 to 1 gram per liter as a spray with horticultural oil, about half a gram, half a mil per liter is a, is a good uh, formulation. Mill stop, for example, the commercially available uh, fungicide is actually potassium bicarbonate. So what it does is uh, it, uh, it sprays the surface of the leaf and it stays alkaline and these fungus spores cannot germinate in an alkaline media. Even if the water is there, if that water droplet is alkaline, then the spores cannot generate. Uh, but potassium, bicarbonate, but potassium bicarbonate is baking soda. Baking soda is sodium bicarbonate. Yes. So, but so, that, yeah, we, we, now we don't like to use it unless in the degrees as an emergency. Right. For example, if you, uh, so always be prepared and have a bag of potassium bicarbonate handy for pH control. So, and as an emergency, you could use one or two applications of sodium bicarbonate as well, but not more than twice, you see. So same grower had those spots on the lower leaves. Those leaves are deteriorating, or we call them senescing. Uh, my initial guess was because uh, leaf is turning yellow, so it is decaying. Uh, the, the spots, you always see them against the light. And if there's a, uh, around those spots, if there's a halo around them, then it is definitely a virus. I don't see a halo around them, except, uh, but I see a target spot, you know, and those are the ones where you throw your arrows. And that's a fungus called alternaria fungus. That's not a serious pathogen. It, it survives on decaying leaves. It, it generally doesn't attack the green leaves. So my 
if, for example, there's a halo around them, then it is to likely tomato spotted wilt virus, which is a Phipps transmitter. So the strategy would be that you uh, look after, find if some on your yellow sticky trap, some Phipps are there. So then Phipps control will be required. So I advise the growers to remove infected leaves and spray with Phyton 27 as a protector. And talking to supplier always may help, but generally they're so busy nowadays that they may not. Uh... Sorry for that, I should have stopped it. Okay, my apologies. Uh... All right. Okay, sorry. All right. Um, here is uh, uh, Michael and I were discussing this picture. Uh, no, that's not Michael, sorry. No, the, I think you're the other one. Dr. Mirza, can you help me? What is wrong with these petunias? They are crazy tunias and sweet tunias. And there's only nine hanging baskets. The same plots on the benches are good. Is it watering? So that, that's, how it, uh, that's how it started. So I asked him to send some more pictures. And these are the other pictures. My questions were, how many plants are showing such symptoms? Also, what fertilizer are you using? So, I mean, first reaction looks like a deficiency of some sort. But as you start looking closely, there's a mosaic pattern. I like to show you a lot more pictures. So finally, uh, the message came back that uh, I only have three plants showing these symptoms. I use 2020 fertilizer and I also use 14, 14, 14 and a slow release uh, in each hanging basket. Personally, I'm not a big fan of slow release fertilizer at the growth stage. Before you sell them, uh, you could put them in. Michael, what's, what's your opinion putting a slow release in hanging basket as a growth? Um, I, I am a huge fan of slow release fertilizer, okay. Okay. Um, personally. Um, we we uh, uh, blend it in with the soil, like we don't okay. put it on top, we don't top dress it. Okay. We, uh, we blend it in with the soil so it's evenly distributed. Okay. And um, um, we, uh, uh, um, we then fertilize as if we did not put that in. So we're not backing down on fertilizer uh, just because it has slow release in it. Because okay. the plants in the baskets are usually where it's warmer. Yeah. Uh, there's more light because they're hanging. And uh, the, 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 the genetics we're using nowadays uh, are, are of the kind that, that uh, more fertilizer. Okay. So just, okay. just giving them the fertilizer through the hose doesn't seem to be enough punch uh, so that we add the slow release. Okay. But, point. you know, but good point. Uh, you know, there is disadvantages about slow release. You would not want to put it in the, in the cell packs yeah. because once you put it in, you cannot take it out. Yeah. Once, you, once it's turned on with moisture and heat, it cannot be turned off. So heat, heat if you have key. a, yeah, yeah, heat is the key. And uh, if, um, if you have a, a crop on the bench, you know, that only sits there for five, six weeks. Yeah. And uh, you have these six packs growing and growing and growing and the weather isn't cooperating that you cannot yeah. turn the growth off. So uh, in, in planters and in baskets, um, I'd say yes. In, in four inch pots and smaller, I'd say no. In six inch pots and smaller, I'd say no. And Michael, what, what, what is your favorite slow release? Mine is uh, uh, from Evergrow and uh, Nutrien. It's okay. a... Um, it's a special hanging basket, one, seven, 13, 24, something like that. Okay, okay. Um, uh, um, fairly heavy on the potassium. And I like to use, the, and, and slow release comes in different um, uh, release times. Yeah. So I use what's called the three month. Okay. okay. And uh, the three months means that your, your, no, actually, sorry, mine is six months. Uh, the hanging basket formula you have is six months so that the customer also gets some benefit from it. Right. Uh, you right. could buy, um, you could buy slow release that, that releases in a year over the course of a year. Well, that's not beneficial to us uh, in the, in the ornamental uh, end of things. So, uh, so the, the six month uh, benefits the customer and you. 
Uh, so Michael, can you monitor chat uh, on if any questions come up? This uh, I've answered. I've answered one or two. Uh, okay. uh, one question was uh, if milt stop should be used, you know, as a preventative, and I said it only works when the fungus is there because milt stop is a contact fungicide. Exactly. Right. Good yeah. point. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. So uh, the plants on the bench seem to be good plants, and plants in all other planters are good. I'm wondering if. Uh, if there were any hanging, might have got cold or dripping off the roof at night uh, and made them too wet. So, but look at the thinking of the grower, you know, he's examining all aspects of uh, possibilities instead of uh, jumping to one thing and uh, then uh, utilizing my experience. So combining growers and my forces together, we are coming up with a solution. And I wrote back that uh, my suspicion is that we are looking at a virus, likely tobacco mosaic virus, uh, could be in the cuttings or if a smoker has handled them. Generally, people take this, my comment, lightly, uh, but uh, smokers are the major source uh, uh, when they transplant it, even if they are uh, uh, come from home, but you know, if they if they are chain smoker, coffee break, they go wash their hands. But this virus, like this COVID, is pretty scary. I mean, it could really spread. Like the new strain of COVID, it just is a it spreads very fast. The symptom may not be as virulent as other. So my suggestion was check them out, and he agreed with that. And done. Uh, three out of forty chucked. Oh, there we go. Uh, somebody put in the chat what uh, what that fertilizer was from from um, Evergrow. Thank you for that. Okay, you did that. All right. Just want to show these uh, uh, trust your your tomatoes. In these are not commercial tomatoes. So this is how the virus looks like. Uh, the tobacco mosaic. One. Look at that uh, off color right here, uh, where my cursor is, and a close up whole leaf uh, lost the color. So this is a good pattern right here. Uh, loss of color mosaic. Uh, sometimes it will be a multiple mosaic as well. Loss of color. It all depends how did the virus got into the system. Uh, look at uh, where my cursor is more white right at the edges, uh, right here. So mosaic simply mean that loss of color. Uh, ultimately, the entire leaf, uh, and then they could be based on if the strain is very dangerous one, more toxic one, virulent one, then the plant will start twisting. They behave like the herbicide. So herbicide and tobacco mosaic virus sometimes become difficult to uh, differentiate. Uh, this is the, uh, Michael and I, we were talking of this petunia. Uh, Michael, like to talk a little bit? Yeah, so um, we we came across one variety of crazy tunias that uh, that showed these signs, and I showed Mirza uh, this picture. And um, after some debate, we we decided that it was not a virus because the pattern, as you saw on the other picture, is not very even. You know, it's just kind of dotted here and there. Then he asked me to send the picture of the bottom of the leaf, and the bottom of the leaf. Uh, uh, also showed, you know, the same signs. So what had happened with this petunia, it was fairly mature when it was moved from the rooting greenhouse where it was about 22 degrees to the hardening off greenhouse where it's about uh, 12 or yeah, maybe about 14 degrees. So that shock uh, between, and, and we, we can't really do anything about it. We, we have to move our uh, rooted material to a hardening off house and earlier in the season like January and February that house is probably about 18 but um, as that house fills up and as the average daily temperature rises um, we we start dropping the temperature so we're about in our holding greenhouse we're about 14 degrees at night and um uh, and then the, the 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 shock, the temperature shock from that 22 degree house to the 14 degree house, actually caused um, some um, oedema on um, on the petunia leaf. So because there was some bubbly, and uh, and that, so that is what we came up with, and it affected the flower as well as the uh, as the plant. Absolutely, yeah. 
Yeah, so that was a temperature thing, nothing to do with the fertilizers or anything like that. This was an interesting one uh, uh, sent by a grower that uh, started looking at this. Uh, uh, I diagnose it as a slimy mold. Uh, it's not a pathogenic fungus. It's not going to affect seriously the, the crop. Uh, this, um, this normally comes when there's a more uh, organic, dead organic matter, not peat, peat moss is organic matter, but sometime um, there's a fungus mycelium of the, the fungi which cause the composting in the forest, etc. So nothing will work on them. So you have to live with that. <laughs> <laughs> the only problem is if they get too bad, you might they might make a surface and the water you cannot be you cannot water them properly. So it inhibits the water. So it's actually just, interesting. It's actually interesting. If that fungus spreads, it actually will prevent water from penetrating the soil. Like it's, exactly, it's actually exactly. uh, it's it's really weird how uh, how an, an, um, a natural product can seal it off or seal the soil completely. Exactly. So then you have to physically remove it, uh, or uh, even a surfactant doesn't work because it just uh, just comes off like that. And this just came in this morning. Uh, onions. Uh, these are the transplant onions, and uh, the the tip uh, burning like that. So after uh, going, uh, asking a few questions. Uh, the grower himself noticed that this was more evident in the uh, the plugs, uh, which which has a smaller cavities. But then later on, I will show you the video he sent because they were ready for for mowing them. How how do you mow 125 trays of onions? So he sent a non more video, which you will enjoy. So I will show you at the end. Uh, uh, thanks to the grower, you see. So. So was there anything wrong with those uh, onions, Mirza? Yeah, the, just the, 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 he wanted to keep them on the dry side, mm. so like they, they dried out a little bit more. Well, you, you, yeah, the, you could, yeah, you could see that by the dead leaves that are on the bottom exactly, that they were that, dry. That's right. That's yeah. right. But then then they, when they go to the field, you cut the, cut the tops yeah. off, so it's not a major damage or major issue, but yeah. it, was a, it was a drying out. What happens uh, when soil dries out and you have a particular EC, exactly. then the exactly. EC will actually go up. Yeah, uh, it's kind of like the Dead Sea, you know, it's more salty when water evaporates. Exactly. So if you were he feeding heavy, then uh, this, uh, this problem would be aggravated in any plant. Um, if you run an EC of over two, then, yeah. uh, then you have to really watch out that your plants don't dry out because uh, these symptoms can show up on anything with a, with a pointy leaf, but anything on a, any plant, basically, uh, if the EC is too high. Yeah, and that's the other point I want to make that uh, uh, EC higher in the root zone is the same thing as water stress on the plant because the uptake of uh, uh, the higher conductivity, higher EC, uh, the roots cannot absorb a proper amount of water from there. Uh, I'd like to introduce you to a little bit more the viruses because they are, we, we, we bring a lot of cuttings from uh, US, South America, other places where the climate is very conducive to insect and viruses. A very nice uh, publication, uh, eGrow. Uh, I get them regularly. If you go to egrow.org, very nice publication. Every month they update on different things. I like their website very much, uh, but I, I do get uh, every week or two weeks some submission. And I found this one that uh, we recently found the chili pepper mild model mosaic virus on Calibroca. So this is quite uh, uh, alarming as well but give you an idea that uh, we have to live with these viruses like we are doing ourselves. So we gave them the other name was tobacco mosaic. We, well, it could be uh, your, uh, the petunia mosaic virus. So, but this is a chili pepper mild mosaic uh, virus. This is uh, causes mottling, flower break, necrotic spots and our general stunt and is being seen on Calibroca this season. Similar to tobacco mosaic virus, 
CPMMOV can be spread by handling. So most of the viruses uh, can be transmitted by handling, by physical contact. So these, because they need an injury. Uh, like in human beings, we know the COVID goes through our nose, through our lungs, and then you need an injury. You know, if your finger is contaminated, hand is contaminated, you, I put in my nose, it could go through there, you see. So slight injury is needed uh, for these viruses to go. So flower break is one symptom, which there, here is a close up of that, uh, flower break symptoms of a CPMM. Actually, uh, originally many cultivars came into picture because they have a virus in them and that's different colors came in. Now this will be beautiful color, uh, variegation of different type. And in some cases they maintain the virus in them so that, they, so that you could get this color. Other are some, of course, they genetically modified them. Uh, I, these are my pictures from the screen, but there's a nice publication as well when you go to their website on this viruses. So if you notice, uh, there is a, there's a spotting there as well. If you look closely right here, there's a spot, there's a spot, round spot and mosaic pattern right here. I think I have a better picture as well, yeah. So here is a mosaic pattern on the leaves. Uh, right here is a good one, mosaic one. Very dark uh, green, dark green here and lighter on the edges. So quite a bit of mosaic patterns uh, is an indication of uh, this one. Here is a good one, necrotic spot symptom. Later on, what happened is the plant tries to contain these virus particles by killing the cells around them. And this is, uh, this is the result of that. Uh, symptoms of flower break and mortal cause uh, by CPMMOV on Calibroca leaves, uh, photocortisophilies. So in, in many other varieties as well, this could show the, the break. And the bottom picture is a little bit better if you see how the mosaic pattern is. All leaves are showing these uh, mosaic patterns. And uh, many times uh, growers want uh, to confirm it. You know, some, some larger growers want to confirm it. So Michael and I, we are very aware of this company, AGDIA, A-G-D-I-A. These are the testing strip, exactly like if you have those home testing kit uh, now available for COVID, they're slightly different, but they look at those, uh, uh, if you take the leaf and they crush it in a buffer and then uh, put on the end of this uh, stick there and it will react to this. This is reaction with tobacco, tobacco mosaic virus test strips. So TMB test strips, so you could easily buy them from ACDIA website. Uh, so I know Michael always have some handy because he's a supplier, so he has to be very careful with these ones. So, but anybody could buy these and uh, could easily confirm it if that's what's needed. And they, uh, they do expire, they have a best before yeah. date. Yeah. So, so don't buy a ton um, yeah. of these things, just buy what you need for the year. Yeah, exactly. So AGDIA, A -G -D -I -A, their website. This was an interesting email from a grower that uh, uh, we are having an issues with our plants that arrived Thursday. We picked up them Thursday afternoon. We are uh, heating the greenhouse with a direct vented propane heater and a Herman Nelson heater, of course, at night. Uh, temperatures down to 15 at night and daytime 24, 28. Uh, they have all started to look almost sun scalded. Uh, they have a slow release fertilizer mixed in the soil, sustain 8-2-4 and at the low dose. Thank you. So th this is what the email came in. And uh, then he said that the only thing we can think of is that the thousand liter water tote we have inside the greenhouse foamed up when we added water. The guy we bought from said it had food grade detergent in it. Uh, so always be careful when we buy these water totes or water tanks, you got to know what was used before. 
if a herbicide was used, you could wash them even very small concentration. And we have seen those actual those drums, those 50 gallon drums, which growers used for watering and it almost destroyed their crop, you see, because of the low concentration by the time. So very careful, please right from the beginning that uh, the material, the plastic or horticulture is safe. They have not been what, what they used before. Could this be our problem? And do we need to remove all plugs from the current soil and put in fresh with new water? Or what do you recommend? I have attached pictures. So this is how the picture uh, on my right, your left, so a lot of foaming was there. But these are the picture uh, of the plants. So right away, you could see there's a physical damage to them. There's a loss of color on them. So before I could make a, uh, ask more questions, I may give my opinion. His email came, Dr. Mirza. Uh, we see, I have to scratch my head to find out an explanation. <laughs> so he said that Dr. Mirza, we determined that it was our supplemental heat that caused ethylene damage to our plants. No doubt to those heaters, even if they are vented, uh, they are, uh, their combustion is different. And uh, they're, if they uh, deplete the oxygen for combustion, then um, ethylene damage. And said, I said, thank you. It is very likely that propane heater exhaust did that damage. Beside ethylene, I see physical damage on leaves, which could be due to other pollutants. There's a sulfur dioxide as well. And once the sulfur dioxide from the fuel mixed with water, it becomes more uh, sulfuric acid. And the, the symptom you see are more of a, a sulfur, sulfuric acid type damage, more loss of color as if directly something, uh, ethylene gives more uh, herbicide type damage. They start uh, going spindly, like a 2,4-D type damage. So this is more likely that there was a humidity as well. So it combined with the sulfur dioxide from those uh, heaters and caused the damage. Uh, we do not have it. I did ask the question that, uh, did you have a PHEC meter? We don't have it. I just wanted to rule out those things that we have since rinsed the tanks out through thoroughly and will use the town water. Uh, do you have any recommendation for temporary heat until we can get a furnace that will keep up? We don't have natural gas at the greenhouse yet. Do you have any? So this grower is ready for the season, but the greenhouse is complete, but the heating is not there. Uh, do you have any companies you could recommend in that area? And that's where my good friend, Michael, came handy. I phoned him, Michael. I don't know anybody. You deal with them daily. So uh, I put them in touch. And uh, Michael tells me that uh, uh, things have progressed very well. Well, so let, me, let, yeah, let me tell the rest of the story. So I called the <laughs> grower. And uh, we, we discussed that you know, they figured they needed both heaters to keep the greenhouse at 18 or 20 degrees. I says, well, at night, uh, you, you're probably fine this time of the year at 16. It doesn't need to be that warm. So they had some insulated blankets they put over top of the plants. And, but then they had to get up really early in the morning to get the blankets off because yeah. uh, the light, you know, like they had to get up, you know. So I said, I said uh, uh, if your heater that you currently have, not the Herman Nelson, but the direct vented heater, was something like an infrared heater, Mirza. That's how it turned out. It was okay. a, it was, yeah. So, and, and of course, the, the, the flu was vented out, you know, through the side. So there was no yeah. flu in there. So I yeah. said to them, what would happen if you, like, I mean, by the time you have a heater installed, the season will be over or you don't need yeah. one anymore yeah. because yeah. pretty soon we're not going to need a heater anymore. Who would have thought it would be minus nine this morning in, in Edmonton, Alberta? But what the <laughs> heck, you know? So, so I said, what would happen? Is there a way to, to the, the, the heater does not have enough capacity? Why don't you make the greenhouse smaller? So I recommended that they put up some ropes and they put a sheet of plastic in about seven feet up, you know, mm -hmm. so they could just walk underneath it and, and, and create, you know, a dome inside the dome. It would, it would, they would keep it closed on a day like today, 
because you know it's so cold and windy but i said the trick here and and i said make it so that the sheets of plastic meet in the middle and overlap i said but the, but the trick is that if you do that and in the morning you know you have a nice warm or relatively warm smaller greenhouse if you would open this plastic you know in a hurry the yeah. cold air from above there would fall on your plants yeah. and it would hurt them so I said to them, if you have it like this, open it about a foot for an hour or half an hour, and then you can open it to the rest of the way so that the, the, the two uh, uh, temperatures can kind of collide and, and, and you know, make it a homogenized thing. But uh, so they said they were able to do that. You know, they thought that was a good idea. So um, making your greenhouse smaller for the time being, you know, will increase, you know, the cap capability of a heater if it's too small. Hey, great comment, Michael. Really, that's that's fantastic. Okay, I mean, basically, pandemic, finding heating contractors, the greenhouse experience, sizing of the furnace, no natural gas, uh, plants are coming in. Fortunately, we have great group of growers who are always willing to help. You know, people like Michael and Debbie and uh, all the growers, you know, who join in here, really enjoy their help you see which uh, many times i tell the beginner girls go talk to these people and uh, and michael and i was talking that that is uh, that's what the industry is we're very fortunate for uh, this uh, group of uh, protected crop growers yeah so this is i talked already about it uh, this is a, a grower sent some uh, marigold uh, plants and uh, black spots on them uh, marigold is a very good indicator plot for pH in the growing media. When the pH start going below 5.5 5 to 5.3, then the uptake of iron is four times higher. And that's what you see. That's the plant is trying desperately to get rid of that iron as, as good as possible. If the, if the pH is not corrected, then uh, those spots will become more darker and darker, and then more damage will occur. Uh, this is a slide from last year. I just want to, this is a this is a basil ready for. This was right in May when the greenhouse was open, and then the pH was uh, 4.9. I think the growers didn't pay attention, and very acidic fertilizer was being used on that. So, I mean, one may see how much damage is on the leaves. It looks like uh, physical damage, but that's what the pH does. When there's a high uptake of uh, uh, iron and manganese and zinc, it goes out in the skin, in the tissue remotest part of the plant to conserve it, and this kind of damage occurs. And this is also from last year, a very cold temperature tomato crop. Uh, the moment the purple colors come in, so this is what will happen. Uh, some people grow some early cucumber as well, and uh, no heat in the greenhouse, all sort of problems. Cucumbers like the minimum day temperature of is a warm crop. And look at this is all male flowers coming in. Normally it's a female variety. So, but uh, uh, then male flowers get poly they pollinate the female, the, the fruit will become uh, bitter. And uh, in, in one case, I saw those were the baskets of uh, uh, cucumber plants, uh, which were showing these symptoms. So we just have to be careful, keep them in a warm area. You have to prune them a little differently, select proper variety, but look at the malformed fruit as well. Once the plant is under stress, uh, the fruit will be malformed. I uh, I talked to the grower, yeah. and because uh, I remember that slide, and yeah. uh, she had used some uh, some obscure cucumber varieties, okay. and uh, these were <clears throat> these were not commercial cucumbers. Okay. So yeah. you know, even a little bit of stress would have caused these female flowers. Yeah. And yeah. and uh, you know, so I uh, at that time we talked about uh, you know better fertilizer strategy, but mostly different varieties. Absolutely. Great point, Michael. And of course, uh, they, I didn't see any, Michael, did you see from anybody? <laughs> uh, I, I, um, 
we we saw a few, you know, but we uh, got them under control. And uh, but yes, it is the time of the year that uh, yeah. aphids um, aphids start showing up out of nowhere. So just be alert, please, and start looking at the under. They they try to hide from you as well. You might kill them. So just be alert that they will go down. And uh, this is another slide where Michael and I we were talking uh, uh, on petunias. And this is what we send you as well. Michael, anybody in the chat commented? Uh, no, I don't think so. So let's. Um, uh, uh, somebody said there's an aphid fairy. Yes, yes. They, uh, they. Uh, I sometimes think that the chemical company disperses these things in our greenhouses so they can sell <laughs> us chemical to get rid of them. So, <laughs> so. But anyway, um, one of the pictures that we sent, uh, the one with the petunia, it resembles this here. And but this was your first thought that this was boron, but it's not. Yeah, yeah. This is uh, exactly. Yeah, we. It could be boron as well, but uh, in this case, uh, the typical rosetting is there. You know, on the and you remember Michael when we examined the plugs uh, here. When on the right side, my right picture, there's a rosetting. Lower leaves are bigger, and this is called typical rosetting. But when I asked Michael to cut the plug open a little bit, uh, and I think I did when I was visiting it it became clear to me that uh, uh, it is not a boron deficiency. It is a overuse of uh, growth regulator bonsai. So the many times when the large plug splits and the material, uh, this uh, ultimately plants uh, did come out of it. But look at uh, if the symptoms are like this one on the right, plant is desperately trying to cover. This is a more like boron deficiency, but they could be, they are related as well. When the, when there's a boron deficiency, it triggers a certain hormones which act as a growth regulator. But the uh, bonsai did it, you know, when you cut it open, notice how very compact uh, growth right here. So if you find these type of plugs, uh, uh, then generally they have been overdone. And that's all just check with the supplier that uh, if any growth regulator was used by them. Michael, any further comment on that? Uh, yeah, no. And, and uh, rosetting uh, happens often in the plug stage. Yeah. But um, you and I have, and, and we will, uh, if we see it happening, and, and at some years it doesn't happen. It didn't happen yeah. this year. Yeah. But uh, some years it happens, and I don't know why. But uh, then we will add boron to the fertilizer solution yeah. to, to mitigate it. But yeah. uh, you told me that boron is only absorbed into the plant if it has roots. So there's no point in putting it on uh, cuttings that have no roots. Yeah. And, yeah. and uh, when the plants are being transplanted, you know, it outgrows it. Yeah. So, so even if you do get some plugs, uh, petunias are particularly sensitive. Yes. Um, they um, they will outgrow it once you once you start uh, giving it more space. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. wonderful. Thanks. And this was the other example we sent. Uh, uh, since uh, no comments came back, uh, that's uh, uh, <laughs> this is an old slide taken on fifth of May. Unsaleable economic losses. So this is serious business. You know, if the, if your PH you are not monitoring on geraniums, May 5th will be difficult to turn around. Growers remove the leaves and may have been able to salvage them for later. But uh, enough warning, iron deficiency with pH related, you see. So that's what the second one we sent to you. So please watch very carefully. We have talked about it, that the your geraniums, your marigolds, uh, your esters, your uh, New Guinea impatient, they're very, very sensitive to low pH, below 5.5. This was about 5.2. Uh, and they will give you enough warning on the lower leaves if you didn't pay any attention. Just to you remove the leaf, but then the next leaf will be affected. So you have to watch. And then your um, fast growing plants, your petunias and pansies and baskets, they are more sensitive to higher alkaline pH. So, Always remember that uh, 
uh, economic losses. And right now we have to be very careful. We can't afford to lose single plant, you see, so. And this is also took from um, a few years ago, tomato spotted wilt virus uh, on petunias. And I remember we talked with Michael that look at uh, spotting on them. So the, uh, there's a necrotic spot around and there's a small halo around them. So this is a, and that's how we try to control threats. Yeah, and not to be confused, a lot of the uh, plants um, you know, will show that sometimes. Yep. Uh, and if uh, you you always tell me to hold it against the light to see if exactly, you see a, exactly. a bite mark in the middle. Yep. Yep. If there's a bite, <clears throat> if there's a bite mark in the middle, then the thrips would have uh, infected that plant, and the Absolutely. virus will start to grow. Absolutely. But if there's a halo around it, then there is a way that the plant protects it, you exactly. know, from from spreading. Yep. So um, so even though a, a thrip may infect a plant, doesn't mean you're going to get the virus right away. Exactly. If the plant is healthy, you know, it will actually stop it, you know, by by a form of that of that halo. Michael, what is in the chat? Anybody has a question there? Uh, well, somebody said, uh, that Justin said that there is a, a, a material available that uh, counteracts um, the effect of a growth regulator like bonsai okay. and the product is called fresco so fresco it, fresco. fresco will off uh, will will neutralize uh, any uh, growth regulator and then it'll start to grow again good point uh, justin yeah i was going to mention that normally i recommend them uh, also to give them a shot of um, uh, high say 20 10 20 half a gram per liter a couple of times and then nitrogen really give them a burst, you see, so that, uh, but great point. Uh, fresco I, fresco is, an, is an amazing material. Um, it also, um, uh, you know, but, you know, you need so little that, yeah. you know, we could probably as, a, as, a, as an AGGA buy one, one jug and give everybody an <laughs> eyedropper full because it is so little that you need. It's, it's a pretty amazing product. Yeah, we should keep in mind, I guess. <laughs> okay, last few slides, uh, LG. Chronic problem, every year I see it, especially if you're growing plugs, begonias, long time. Uh, so everybody know what algae means, but uh, algae also mean uh, diseases, your fungus nets. I mean, look at those trays, uh, then uh, I mean, if, if something will germinate, algae will, uh, uh, will destroy them. And uh, free water, and fungus nets, uh, it, so they go hand in hand. Fungus nets are always living in algae. And uh, leaked water, algae and fungus nets. <laughs> this was interesting in the greenhouse. Your water filter here, your pipes, grow didn't pay attention. So hot spot for fungus net, because if they are on the floor, they have to fly up. But in this case, they, they are right uh, around very close to your plants. So le leaked water nutrient is the key for them. And uh, quickly use of hydron peroxide. Uh, basically hydron peroxide uh, is a one hydrogen and two oxygen, H2O2, two hydrogen, sorry. Yeah, H2O2, H2O2 not one, yeah. two, two hydrogen, yeah, H2O2. And ozone is O3. Uh, uh, zero tall, so please correct it, not one hydrogen, but two hydrogen, okay. So zero tall is, uh, is a hydrogen-based uh, product, 27%, and, but they do add uh, another very powerful antioxidant called peroxyacetic acid, POA. And plus they add some surfactant and stabilizing agents so that uh, you have to use less rate and the, the claim I was looking at the label that uh, zero tall is uh, 12 to 13% more effective than uh, hydrogen peroxide and more stable. Hydrogen peroxide wants to make up a solution. Unless uh, it is in distal water, then it will stay for about half an hour uh, as an active, bioactive. If it's a regular water with some organic matter there, then it goes down pretty quickly. Sunny date is also like uh, zero tall. Uh, it has it's a peroxide base plus peroxyacetic acid. Uh, 
algae is a plant. It doesn't. It does the photosynthesis like other plants. It utilizes all the nutrients which plants need. Multiplies very fast. And water is the starting point. Growing media, yes, because that's a natural product. Your peak mass, but your starting point is, is your water. So for the success of algae control, you have to start from day one with your water and also with the growing media. Uh, how, do, how does it work? You mix uh, hydrogen peroxide with water or zero tol. The, it is stabilized at a, a pH of about three to four. The pH changes and that extra oxygen is released and that oxygen is unstable. It has to find an organic matter, algae spore, methyl spore, fungus spores. That oxygen atom looks for organic matter to hang on to and thus oxidizes it and then kills it. The rest is water. So O2, one oxygen gone, become H2O. So one has to neutralize all the organic matter in your water. This means one should be able to detect residual amount about five to 10 ppm of peroxide. So if you have a holding tank, you add peroxide there, then uh, in the first, if the first time application, hydrogen peroxide level will drop pretty fast up to zero, then you add more. So you need about five to 10 ppm of residue for, to be effective going to the growing medium. Testing strips are available and we, sh we should have them. And uh, generally recommendation is to the water about 100 ppm of peroxide, uh, zero tall and sunny day rates are also on the label. Uh, we did a study in a vegetable greenhouse where we added 50 ppm in the irrigation line and detected 10 ppm at the dippers. This is because uh, growers, they were never, the irrigation pipes were never cleaned up for a long time. So biofilm inside the irrigation pipe used up the peroxide. That's why seasonal cleanup is so important too. So make it a habit of using peroxide regularly. Cover the water totally black. That's absolutely essential in your water. Uh, people using the white or opaque light still you notice algae could start developing. So covering them even Covering the deck, you know, where, where the opening is, is important. And then uh, black uh, irrigation pipes, most of us use black. All right, I'm stop sharing. And Michael, any quick questions there? Um, we, we answered all the questions, but um, <laughs> I, I, I've had a few people who have talked uh, and phoned me, emailed me about hydrogen peroxide. And hydrogen, you, you touched on uh, the, the essential things of hydrogen peroxide. I, I had one person that said to me, oh, I'm seeing algae, you know, and uh, now I have some fungus gnats and sure flies, and now I want to use hydrogen peroxide. That's yeah. almost too late. When, yeah. when the algae has formed, it is nearly impossible to reverse, you know, the, you cannot put enough hydrogen peroxide on the, on the soil to reverse the algae. So yep. you have to really use the hydrogen peroxide, whether it's Zerotol or Sanadate or whatever, you have to use it before the algae starts. You can't really uh, get rid of it after. You know, you, you, you would have to use so much hydrogen peroxide, it would kill the plants before it would kill the algae. So, and then you touched on another thing, which is important, that one rate does not fit everybody because the amount of uh, 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 organic material you have in your water, do you have a dugout? Do you have uh, municipal water? How dirty are your pipes? All these things will determine how much hydrogen peroxide comes out at the end of the hose. Absolutely. Now, Absolutely. my personal opinion is that we should have a minimum of 100 parts per million coming out at the end of the hose, yep. uh, because that is enough to, to, to uh, it, because you want, some hydrogen peroxide to come out of the end of the hose. You want the, ho the piping and the system and your holding tanks, you want them to be clean, but you also want any algae spore that tries to start, you know, to be inactivated by the hydrogen peroxide. So 100 to 200 parts per million is what we aim for uh, out of the, um, um, uh, out of the um, hose. And then that will help, uh, that will help the, the you know, the onset of hydrogen uh, of algae and 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 somebody said like you said uh, oh i see fungus gnats and shore flies um well they can come from the soil 
And they, because they don't just need algae to develop. They also, you know, your peat moss that you're using, your soil mix that you're using is already decaying a little bit from the, the day that you start putting it in your pots and start watering. Now, those, those uh, fungus gnats and shorefly larvae probably come with the soil because it was an organic product. Yep. And now they have something that they can live on and eat on. So even if you have zero algae, you could still have fungus gnats and shoreflies. So I collect, it, yeah. Sorry, yeah, I quickly have to share that lawnmower cutting the onion. Oh yeah, okay. Just allow me sharing it. Okay, let me try once more. If not, uh, <laughs> yeah. It's a beautiful lawnmower. Yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah. Just a second. I have to... Where did it go? Oh, here. Downloads. Okay. Can you see it? No, we, we just see the file. We uh, It didn't open yet. <laughs> did you get it no no oh wait no no oh, you, did, you didn't see it no we didn't see it okay just let me one more try yeah, okay, that's okay. a beautiful one three is a charm okay. you were able you were able to help me with my uh, camera so you should be able to figure this out too so okay can you see it now well we can hear the noise but we can't see the uh the video oh how come oh, okay hmm. Um, while uh, while you're doing that, Mirza, Sean had a question. Um, and this is, do you recommend uh, flushing your system with peroxide after each season? Um, your excuse, Sean. You have a young baby, so uh, you know you probably are doing something else with the kid. Um, so, uh, Sean, um, the, the best way to clean uh, and and clean uh, um, lines at the end of the season, and whether you use Nature Source or anything else, that is a very good practice. You know, you're on your drippers, is to make a solution of pH two, and that is what you would uh, put uh, in. Um, you know, you would, uh, the pH solution of two, you, you, you put that in the lines, you know, in everywhere, your drip lines, your hoses, everything. That's it for about 12 hours. And then you flush it out. And then you can use something like zero dollar hydrogen peroxide or Sanidate. Um, and you put that in. Uh, we, we use it straight out of the jug. Uh, and uh, use a 1 to 100 injector. So Sanidate 5 is what we use, uh, straight out of the jug, um, 1 to 100, put it in the system, let it sit for, over, uh, for 24 hours, and then flush it out with clean water. But the, the, the best thing is to, to start with a pH 2 solution of water. So Michael, two, were you yeah. able, did you able to see it, the lawnmower? No, unfortunately not, Mirza. Did anybody? Oh, sorry for that. I tried two times. Okay. That's okay. Nobody, maybe next time. <laughs> and, uh, and, yeah. Gail had a question, Mirza. Why does the soil sometimes turn black and crusty? Yeah, that, that's that's a water uh, holding thing. I think in the last one I showed some picture that it, it will do that at the top. Sometimes the peat moss quality is uh, a little instead of pure smeg sphagnum, there's some other peat mosses there, so they dry out much faster. Right. So basically, uh, yeah, it just is a watering related and the growing media uh, is, is not pure sphagnum, something else could be there. Um, so Sandra is asking how much acid you would use to get to a pH 2. Uh, this goes back to some of the discussions we had, uh, you know, early in the season. Uh, in the greenhouse chat is that um, it, the alkalinity of your water determines how much acid you have to use to get the pH to two. 
So a, a simple test is to take, say, a measured amount of water, five liters, 10 liters, and you take a syringe um, and you suck up some acid. You measure the pH of your water. Uh, I mean, Mirza has explained how you can do it uh, scientifically, but, you know, us farmers, you know, we would probably <laughs> take a measured amount of water and then a syringe and put some acid in, like one milliliter at a time, measure your acid, measure your pH, another milliliter, and then measure your pH till you get to a pH of two. And then you know how many milliliters per measured amount you need to use to get to pH two. And uh, Sandra has that pH curve she made uh, three, four years ago. Yeah. So she, she, Sandra, you could figure out the rates from there. Yeah. And yeah. I, that also remind me that uh, I found on the internet a beautiful uh, website, a working sheet for acid injection. You have to work out your bicarbonate and uh, I, I, I'll find out while Mike, you're talking and might share because that's a good one. Uh, if, if work, worksheet, uh, you start making calculation every time. Yeah. Um, okay, so can I introduce Justin? Yes, please. Michael. Yes, so yeah. Justin is uh, with us tonight and he is the owner of a company called Local Nurseries. So uh, uh, it is by Devon, if anybody's from this area, it's between uh, the Botanical Garden and uh, Enoch Reserve, kind of in there on Highway 60. And um, he purchased that three years ago when him and his wife purchased that three years ago from a company called Canner Nurseries. Uh, so maybe some of you remember Canner Nurseries. It's now called Local Nursery. It's a retail wholesale kind of um, uh, tree nursery uh, where Justin tries some, and does some interesting things. So tell us about it, Justin. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, can can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Oh, excellent. Um, uh, I also just touching on the uh, last few things you just spoke on uh, experience a little bit more of the gl uh, black film that's created on uh, the substrate. Um, and we found um, in one of our facilities, we use uh, well water. Um, rarely happens with the well water unless it's not regularly used. So earlier in the seasons, we'll find um, that maybe to happen. But later as the water consumption rises, we, we don't find it to be um, uh, happening. But on another facility um, where we use um, uh, dugout water, high organic water, um, we, we find that to be uh, directly the case. And, and um, so I, I, can, I can see someone's uh, frustration in that. Um, you could clearly just stir the top of the substrate uh, to dry that matter and, and it basically uh, erases itself almost, um, it basically creates itself non-existent in, in a matter of less than a week. So just a heads up on that one. Uh, yeah, so Local Nursery is a um, interesting uh, venture. Myself and um, my wife and the staff have um, got involved with. Uh, yeah, it is a part of um, uh, the previous um, uh, Canner Nurseries group of companies uh, out of BC, uh, located uh, um, in full fledged form um, in uh, Chilliwack. Um, and they're heavily into obviously uh, the growing of um, uh, young products, um, specifically um, bare root trees and um, and also uh, bucket and caliper trees as well. So you would, uh, you know, if anyone's in the nursery side of the world here, um, you would kind of relate them into the Byland scenario or the, the Braun and Sons, maybe not Braun, uh, more like uh, Aubins or Jeffries or, you know, um, some of these larger, larger type growers, but uh, so yeah, we 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 purchased um, this organization and um, had full intention on trying to return it back to its former glory. Um, the person who um, had created the property, uh, it was built on a swamp, very unique property. Um, there's a hundred feet of sand uh, on top of um, basically groundwater, uh, so you can imagine how unique that property truly is. Um, we have um, indulged ourselves into a lot of bud grafting, um, coniferous grafting, um, um, shrub production um, in, in both, uh, not so much the propagation of shrubs at the moment, but, but more finishing up them. So we would bring in, you know, uh, some rocket liners, uh, things like this from uh, some of the larger growers in, in, um, in the valley. 
and um, and finish them. So what we're trying to do and understand in our market is, is uh, and then we're talking about the Alberta market clearly, is um, negate some of the rapid increases of our costs uh, to us. And um, one of the things, um, in fact, we just got noticed today from a company named Aubin, I'm sure some of you have heard of these guys, um, uh, along with Jeffries. Uh, they basically sent out a notice saying, please come pick up your product this year. Um, the prices of shipping have gone through the roof and we're not sure how to quote you anymore, um, which is just an absurd statement uh, to make to someone who's, um, you know, obviously brings in, you know, a substantial amount of product, but, but also to try to run your business and, and, and your, you know, uh, to try to try to uh, look at some of your costs and what you're going to do uh, with the product when it arrives, uh, it, it gets very scary. So, so we kind of have, have thought about this for a long time. And, and, um, and so we, we, we have gone down the path of trying to basically create uh, as much uh, of our products ourselves uh, and make them available to people uh, in our industry, um, not only landscape trades, um, but also uh, <clears throat> other growers and, and, uh, and retailers. Yeah, now you were explaining, Justin, that, uh, you know, not somebody can, uh, you know, pick up the phone and just order a whole bunch of stuff because uh, this, this crop needs to grow for a while. Like, you, it's not like a petunia. <laughs> Yeah, uh, it's clearly um, we, you know, the, the shorter the time frame, the weaker the plant, right? I mean, um, we know this from, you know, literally looking at some of the stuff that comes from the valley. If you receive a tree that's 10 feet tall and it's called an ivory silk lilac, uh, which has never been created in Alberta, you could realize that the heat content put on that tree clearly is, is out um, in the wrong zone. So it's basically like taking, you know, tropical plants and growing them um, up in the, up in the cold North. It's, it's quite difficult, um, you know, to, to do that. So yeah, the longer, the better. Um, but, you know, obviously, you, you, you know, costs have, have something in mind. So it's, it's basically a two year crop and we try to, um, you know, do our best to keep them, uh, flush early in the greenhouse and then uh and then grow them outside temperatures we have wonderful uh light levels here in alberta uh midsummer um we we can grow some serious great crops in our in our uh in our fields and in our in our temperatures unfortunately our, our fall comes very quick and so that's the difference basically from us and um in the valleys and, and that's where your zone changes go happen so so we we put them back in the greenhouse and, and try to shut them down naturally and, and we basically create a reasonable product, um, um, you know, to our ability in, in two years, right? Um, some of it is available in the first year in a two gallon. Um, you know, some of the fast growing crops, it's, it's pruned once. So we, we, we definitely, if, if anyone's familiar with the landscape protocol, uh, most shrubs will have five basal branches. Um, and, uh, you know, north of seven is preferred, but, uh, but that gives you a nice bushy, bushy shrub. And, and, then, and um, that's a, as it were, quote, legal shrub to use in, in, in the trade. So, um, but, you know, you should plan on at least a second year flush to get a reasonably good shrub. Yeah. And uh, is, is there any of this product available yet? Like I'm, 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 I'm guessing a lot of growers, grower retailers have, have purchased their nursery stock already for 2022. But uh, is there availability if you needed something in a hurry or you needed something unexpectedly? Because uh, freight is indeed an issue. Um, uh, freight surcharges, uh, all of a sudden you don't know what you're going to be paying and how to mark it up after that. Yeah, uh, I, I, I mean, we haven't been growing a lot of typical spec. Uh, I, I don't, I don't think that's a very advantageous way to run your business. Um, it's it's very risky, and uh, you know, we try to mitigate some of these risks by managing what we've been selling, uh, not only internally to the trades, but um, but to retail and 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 for those people who qualify for wholesale. So we, we do have uh, availability for sure. I mean, um, before landscapers snag it up, um, but I, I wouldn't, uh, A, I wouldn't wait too long and B, it's, it's kind of a long-term thinking plan. It, it, it's not a, uh, something that, you know, you can turn a switch and, and, and try to, you know, put an order for 500 shrubs or something. It's, it's, it's kind of a slow process. And, and uh, um, I would highly recommend that, you know, you, you start thinking, um, 
into the future uh, as far as what you'd like to see. And, and, and again, you know, they're bread and butter shrubs. Um, uh, I, I keep saying that word, but I, I should include perennials as well. Um, but I mean, these, these things should be kind of, you know, staggered into the future. Um, and, and you should, you know, if you'd like to speculate some, um, you and I, Michael, have talked of, uh, in depth about these things, you know, maybe 10, 15% at max, you know, don't, 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 you know, recreate the wheel, um, you know, keep things simple and, and, and grow with your market. So, um, but again, like we do this because, you know, we're, we're seeing cost pr um, pressures put on us uh, with, with trucking and shipping. Um, and if anyone would like to hear a short story about some truckers recently that I had to deal with, uh, it, it's, it's kind of funny. They, uh, maybe I shouldn't repeat it. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, basically, the guy wouldn't get out of his truck. Uh, you know, he basically said, "Your load is your load, and and have at it." And then, uh, and then he, you know, wanted to use our facilities for a different reason. And I kind of said, "Well, your truck's your truck, so stay." <laughs> um, you know, I mean, it was kind of a, uh, you know, kind of a thumb in the eye on both sides, I guess. Uh, but I was kind of upset at that. So, yeah. Um, but it's just kind of goes to show you that we're, we're entering into a new era of um, labor shortage, um, not in our industry, but in every industry and uh, trucking is, is no different. Um, so that that's an, an availability of trucks is going to be tight. So it's, it's, um, it's crazy to say that so early, but that, that's where we're at. Um, yeah, with respect to perennials, I will say um, my wife reminded me today that we needed to get our orders in for, uh, for 2023 um, in the next uh, 10 days. Um, so, so for most, uh, most of us who um, you know, want to order through um, larger growers, uh, large nurseries for perennials, um, they, uh, they have to have their orders in um, before the end of April for um, typical spring delivery of 2023 for the 2023 growing season. Um, that, that's, that's pretty amazing. Uh, it took us three years to, in order to get some of our suppliers to supply us. Um, we had to wait three years on a waiting list. Um, and so we don't want to be getting off that list for sure. Um, but it allows, um, you know, it just kind of goes to show you the annual side of our, our, our businesses, uh, are, are, are strong and, and, and they're, um, you know, vibrant and, and there's lots of us here who could um, attest to that. And, but our perennial uh, side of the, our, our, um, our, our greenhouses uh, also has uh, great potential and great growth. And, and a lot of breeders are paying a lot of attention to perennials. Um, and I highly recommend people um, uh, take a, take a good, good look at perennials for a subsequent uh, crop in their, in their greenhouses. Oh. It holds lots of value. And the natural attrition for a gardener is, is to start with annuals who are visually stimulated um, by, by color, clearly, um, but also to, to build on their, their, um, their gardens with, with um, um, long-term uh, returning um, flowers, which is basically perennials and shrubs. So it's, it's kind of an evolution of the gardener and, and um, we, we, we've seen that and, and we try to, you know, Put together a package for our clientele, as it were, and, and and do you know as much as we can of it. So, is there a um, how should if somebody needs something, how do should they contact uh, local nurseries? So we had a chat uh, just today about um, about that matter. So I would say um, uh, info at localnursery.ca. Um, that would be um, info at l o c a l n-u-r-s-e-r-y dot c-a um maybe i'll just type it in there for you yeah i'm um, doing that already no oh, thank you thank you um uh, make it attention michelle she's aware of it and um th there's um there's a there's a very large list there as we speak um but the availability of perennials is is um it it it, it gets zapped pretty quick uh in our in our <laughs> in our small industry um by people who um you know, show a lot of demand for perennials and, and, and it, it's there. Uh, it's, it's great. And, and I love to be a part of this industry during these periods of times, because it's, it's, it's wonderful to see that type of growth. And, um, but it's also not to be ignored for, for small growers and small businesses, because I think there's a, um, a substantial margin to be had in perennials if it's done properly. So like that, Justin, local nursery, yes, singular. Yeah. Okay. Yes. 
So I just want to apologize to the last meeting I participated in. I, I, um, I'm in my son's room and I, uh, I spent the night in the hospital after a meeting. Uh, I pulled my back out for some reason in my son's chair. So I, uh, I hope, I hope the outcome's a little better this time. Sure it is. <laughs> yeah. Let's, let's not hope that that's a, you know, it has to do with the chair, you know? <laughs> no, I, I, it happened walking up the stairs and then uh, the doctor at the hospital said, no, you shouldn't have sat down that long. And I'm like, well, I'm not missing that meeting. So, yeah. yeah no. <laughs> so. Okay, and is, is there any questions for Justin? Either unmute and, and ask it or type it in, please. You know, oh, uh, you know, then uh, we can go from there. While we're waiting, I, I, um, I, I thank you, uh, Dr. Mirza and Michael, for uh, again, a wonderful show. Lots of information here and, and much appreciated. Uh, and um, I, I, it seems like every meeting is more informative than ever. So uh, thank you very much. <laughs> we always um, appreciate your wisdom. No? That's always. Value added, I guess. I always appreciate that. I I, uh, I I think you're right uh, when you say um, you know growers uh, have a lot to share and a lot to gain from one another. Um, and there's no um, you know we we we're, you know Mother Nature would be our our um, you know the battle against uh, you know our plant our trying to grow plants and, and battle Mother Nature, which of course is always going to win. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, winter always comes. You know, like uh, there's no getting around it. Um, but uh, I, I, I um, yeah, I find uh, just uh, the ability to work together is um, it's more and more appeasing every day. I, um, I, ha I had a customer last week uh, who came from the construction industry and, and is entering the greenhouse um, horticultural end of things. And he is saying that uh, that is such a unique thing and Mirza mentioned it too that uh, we are not afraid to share, you know, amongst ourselves. And he says in the construction industry, you wouldn't see that. No. So he said uh, it would just be, they won't even tell you whether they're buying their nails or whether they're, whether they're buying their, their two by four. So he said, we are, we, we are in a very good industry and, and it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, a very nice to be part of it. Before you leave, Sean, uh, could please turn your cameras on. I want to take one picture, uh, seeing everybody. Could you turn, I'll give you one minute to turn your pictures on before Michael take over. Uh, turn your cameras on, please. Good, 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 good. Keep it up, keep it up. <laughs> very good, very good. Few more, few more. Excellent. Few more. Pete's iPhone, excellent. Arlene, Laura. Oh, it, the screen looks totally different, you know. <laughs> Few people at the bottom, Laura, Susan, Stacy, Linda, Beth. That will really be very good. Laura, are you there? I'm here. Okay, turn your camera on, please. Oh, yeah, she did it. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Arlene, Susan, Stacy, Linda. Okay, if not, that's good for me. Excellent, thank you. Did you did you take a picture? Yes, I did. Okay, good. We we certainly look forward to seeing everyone at the uh, our annual uh, Green uh, Industry Show too. Yeah, so that's one, right. after that's three right. years of uh, hiding in the basement, you know. No yeah, kidding. Right. Yeah. yeah, no kidding. Yeah. <laughs> Sean says, I don't mean, we have to all put clothes on. But did you see, Sean? Did you see, Sean, when somebody's cameras went on, people just checked their hair right away, you know? Like, uh, <laughs> put their coffee cup down. <laughs> so, okay. Michael, you want to invite Debbie for, uh, for the Google or she would do it at the end? Uh, for the Google? Oh, yes, for the map. But Debbie, are you here? Um, if you could talk about, would you be available to talk to the, about us about the uh, the retail map you're creating? Are you still there, Debbie? Uh, yeah, I'm yeah. here. I'm yeah. Not turning my camera on though because I had a tooth pulled and my face is swollen. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, um, well, I've seen you, so don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> I um. Back in 2018, I started an initiative um, with our county. And they put some dollars and got us some grant money into funding um, like a local um, greenhouse tour thing. 
but you know the way the county works is everything is really slow and they have to get so much permission um you know from other other people within the county to to do stuff so i said i'll make a google map like i could do that tonight so i made a google map and we used that for that promotion and um i just kept adding to it so i just kept adding to the map and my goal was to get every greenhouse in alberta that i could find or some people would tell me about on the map so right now i think there's about 186 or 87 greenhouses on the map and uh, it's super easy because it's just on Google. Like anyone can access it, but I'm the only one who can edit it because I had it, I had it open to the public and then someone added all the Home Depots and I'm like, yeah, that's not what this map is for. So I deleted them all and made it private. Yay. Yay. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's for, so it's the, for like family owned greenhouses, right? That's right. Grower retailers. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah. So you can only convince the cities that uh, uh, independent greenhouses who grow product is is not the same as Home Depot. I, I would be uh, I would be impressed. <laughs> yeah, it's it's that's a hill I'm not ready to climb. But <laughs> uh, I I I'm gonna do a promotion with it, and I'm gonna show it. Um, I'm gonna really blast it on social media here as soon as everyone's ready to open. And so feel free to share it. I think that. I think that people see that our industry does help one another. And I think we've done like last year, the St. Albert Gazette posted about that map in the paper. And I can't tell you how many people came here with the newspaper in hand and said, that's such a nice thing that you did. And I said, that's just how greenhouses are. And, um, and we we know we're not the only place people come to for plants you know they're they're going they're they're hopscotching across the country and going to everyone so why why not share that yeah no uh, i agree and uh, so you're you're you have 186 but you're and have you posted it anywhere did you put it on the marketing form the greenhouse marketing form or not yet yeah i put it on the forum the other night and uh asking anyone if you're not on this map um um, or if you're in the wrong spot to let me know and I'll, I'll adjust it. But if a greenhouse doesn't have a, their own Google pin, um, and if I, if I don't know where you are for sure, then I just, I can't post it because I don't want to get it incorrect. Right. So, I made a lot, made a lot of pins for people though, that didn't know how to do it. Right. So, so Sean, just, just put your pin, uh, email your pin to Debbie. So Debbie type your email address in. Because here it might get lost in the chat. So if you don't mind typing your email address in for, um, for people to send a pin, or if they know of somebody that is not on the map, uh, that they you know, would want them to get at it, and then uh, you know, also send that information to her. There, I put my cell on there. You can just text it to me. But um, if, you're on, if you're on Google Maps, you just type in Alberta Greenhouse Drive, and it should pop up. But th there's a lot of greenhouses I didn't know existed. Like I shared it in um, the Facebook group, Alberta Gardening. If you're not on that, that's a good one too. And uh, and there were like 400 and some comments on it about greenhouses that people wanted me to add. And lots of duplicates, but that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then so you're going to post it to everybody. How are you going to get it out to everybody? Well once the map is once we get closer to selling season um i'm making a video okay. i'm on social media okay okay yeah because it's it's meant for the general public you know it's meant for them to find us yeah and i mean the concept behind it was that where i'm located i'm so close to edmonton but for me to for me to market Edmonton and have someone drive from Edmonton out in the country for one greenhouse, that's maybe not enough of a draw. So if I can say, hey, did you know there's 12 greenhouses within an hour drive, then they'll make a day of it. And maybe they won't come to my place. But if you can get them out of the city and, and touring these little places, it means a lot. Yeah. Yeah, and then and it often will result in that they, like you said, hopscotch from one greenhouse to the next. But they're always going to pick up something at every at every stop that they're at. 
Yeah. And every greenhouse has something totally unique. Like I, I love it. I love touring the greenhouses last summer. Yeah. We just can't do it on the long weekend of May. I know that sucks. <laughs> <laughs> I really want to go this year. <laughs> and, 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 and none of the greenhouse operators who are mothers get to celebrate mother's day other than in the greenhouse. <laughs> I tell my kids that um, my, their gift to me is working with me for the whole day. And they do. So that's kind of nice. Good. Yeah. Anyway, you, yeah. The map and uh, double check it. If you're not on there or you're in the wrong spot, let me know. Good. So Mirza, I uploaded a bunch of pictures of what's going on at HiQ. So if you yep. allow me to share. Yes, then, please uh, go ahead. I give you the permission. So you go ahead. Where is my desktop? I'll share. Great, um, we can see you. Yeah. Hmm. Yes, this is not my. Home, this is, home screen has come out. So. Where is my desktop? Uh, oh, here we go. Can you still see that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna just open up some of these pictures that I uploaded. Uh, um, um, this is uh, the the company dog. <laughs> you see, always uh, always there. You know, uh, close to where I am. Uh -huh. And we. Um, so this is what it looks like. Uh, this is what it looks like. Uh, uh, you know, just before. Uh, oh, somebody posted a a, a post on um, the, the the marketing forum and said, how do you guys uh, maintain your tags? And uh, we use old rolling carts and we put our tags on there uh, in alphabetical order. And we use um, little trays and they're called a 10 by 10. So they're a half the, the, the size of a regular bedding plant tray. And there's a couple of companies that sell them. AMA Plastic sells them, and I believe HDS may sell them as well. And uh, it, it, so two go back to back on a regular shipping cart, and uh, that's usually enough for one. And we tape one of the the tags on the front, and then that's that's what we do. And then we uh, we can reuse the tray if we want. Something changes in the alphabet, we can um, in a variety is added. We can shuffle the rest of them over, you know. So. Um, this is a uh, this picture here is of a crop of uh, hanging baskets that we're doing. So this is uh, about timed for Mother's Day or even a little bit before. Uh, these are 12 inch hanging baskets and uh, they're just popping over the side. Uh, this is a greenhouse that we uh, filled once and now we're filling it again. These are the houses where we have the seedlings in and uh, they, um, uh, a bunch of them have shipped and now uh, we're coming through with a lot of the stuff for later things, Alyssa, mar uh, marigolds uh, that, that are going in there right now. I'm just kind of going through them willy nilly here. Um, when um, at shipping time, this is how we get prepared for uh, for shipping for boxing. So what happens here is we 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 have a computer system that allows us to print out different reports, and a, a report that gets picked that gets printed out is called the pool pick ticket, and that uh, tells us how much of everything that we need. So so if we need. 10 trays of bacopa, it tells us to go get 10 trays of bacopa, um, 10 trays of purple wave petunia or 20 trays, you know, and it goes all on these carts. And then we go through with uh, the person's individual order. And, you know, we take one from here and one from there or, you know, that kind of stuff. So we have the, our main building is lined with these carts on both sides and uh, all the stuff that we need for a particular trucking company or a particular ship date uh, is, uh, is uh, gathered here. And then these uh, things just empty out uh, over the course of a day or, or hours, and uh, they all end up in the boxes. And then how that's how the boxes go to you. Uh, 
This is our cedar. Mm -hmm. This is a, a Blackmore drum cedar. And the Blackmore has a, the tray goes in on this side and uh, the conveyor takes it underneath this roller here that uh, makes the holes. And then the seed goes in this mechanism here. And there's a drum there that turns in reverse direction from uh, the belt. So the, the tray and the, the drum, they meet and then they, it gets turned on. And then uh, the, as the drum turns, it releases a row of seeds in the uh, tray below. This is uh, the house that we talked about that runs at about uh, 13 degrees at night, 12 or 13 degrees where we tone the uh, seedlings. And uh, of course it, it helps uh, uh, make ro more roots in, in a cooler greenhouse, but it also keeps the plant a little shorter. So we don't get a very leafy or lush plant. And that helps us a lot because we can fit them into the shelves on the boxes a lot better, but also we, it, it doesn't, uh, it means that we don't have to cut everything, trim everything. So it helps, helps keep things in, in line short um, that, um, and, then, and then it's shipped from here. I think I showed this slide before. This is, uh, yeah, this is our LED lights. This was earlier in the year. Uh, these are our uh, Philips LED lights. They call them top lights. There's three rows in this in these greenhouses, and they um, they turn on uh, using an Argus environment computer. And uh, this time of the year, if it's a, if it's a bit sunny, then they'll just turn off in the middle of the day. Uh, so because there's more light outside than is uh, than than they can produce, so then uh, it helps you save energy because you're not uh, you're not um, turning them on uh, when they're when they're not when they don't need to be on so this is uh, our ninth greenhouse where we grow a lot of um, pots big pots for uh, cities and towns because that's uh, our crop after we're done with the seedlings and in here you see the array of color uh, that we have and uh, the amount of seedlings that uh, that are here they're being picked through need one of those grab them you know and then and then it looks like a, a patchwork of color after a while but it also you know has some big holes which is what we like to see because uh, we would like to see these plants go to you instead of hanging on to them here another shot of our seedling greenhouses and um, uh, this is uh, the second turn like i said before This shot here is of uh, some two and one gallon cannas that we do. We have some customers that return their canna roots and we, we will replant those in like December or January. And then they stay dormant for a little while. And then when they start to grow, we uh, move them into a, a heated greenhouse and, uh, and then they carry on from here. And these ones are probably sold at the end of May and early June to our, um, to our uh, city and town contract people. This here is our early pansy crop. So this, uh, this, go, this is being shipped uh, at the end of April. So they should just be starting to flower. Uh, then just in a discussion on, uh, you know, if they were gonna go too fast or not, uh, we'll, 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 we'll see. But in a couple of weeks, these have to be shipped. So, uh, and, and hopefully they'll show some color then because they, uh, they're gonna go outside, of course, in a, um, you know, in a landscape display. And I thought I had one picture yet of the snow outside. Uh, where is it? Uh, I don't see it anymore. So we still have a little bit of snow outside uh, in the greenhouse, but uh, outside the greenhouse, but um, uh, most of it is gone. So that's what we have going on at Haikyuu. Okay, Michael, that's really fantastic there. So. A couple of other things. Uh, our uh, opening dates uh, settled most of the greenhouses now. Uh, Vanessa, are you open already? Uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, are, I don't... We are not open yet. We're doing an early bird day. Just we had a bunch of requests. Okay. So that's actually this Saturday. So it's a current disaster up there. So lots of work to do in the next 72 hours. But uh, we're gonna do an early bird day and it's just basically uh, potatoes, seeds and 
some other things that are ready, but uh, obviously our bench stuff is needs a little more time to grow. And then we actually open the 28th of April. So the early bird are special people or how do you advertise? Uh, no, it's just open to anybody we find in our community a little bit more north of Edmonton. It's okay. it's brown and disgusting and lots of people just need to see some green and it is just as an event for people to do. They can come out, just look at the green, it gets them thinking and then, uh, you know, hopefully, you know, just creating an experience for them to come uh, right, and come right. back. So that's the idea is just come and see what's here and what's growing and think about what you want. Um, you know, and yeah, we'll go from there. It's just an experiment this year. And there's a few greenhouses uh, north of north and west of Edmonton that do it. So we thought, well, we've been asked a few times, so we'll try it. Any of you organize special uh, day for uh, handicapped people by any chance, uh, exclusively for people like that or difficult to organize? We have one for seniors. We were contacted by the local lodge for okay. seniors. Um, our greenhouse is a little challenging for seniors to get into because there's two steps to get up okay. into the main part and one step down. Uh, so it can be challenging. So we just kind of give them an evening and they they just come. I think there's like, there's only 15 or 20 of them on the bus right. that come, right. but they often like with COVID, they haven't been able to get out of the building no, right, right so you know this is their first major outing in two years and there's a lot of you know uh, elderly gardeners and people that love green so it's just right, something right. to do for the community and lots of their um i guess their children or their family members that are younger will come with them so again it's just another another event that we do yeah. Sorry, I was talking really close there. Uh, I, I, still, I still have your request for strawberries. I'm putting an article on strawberries in the coming newsletter so that uh, those who are members will get a copy. Uh, I'm working on it. So strawberries are getting quite, uh, uh, I mean, of course, you grow strawberry as a bedding plant, baskets. Uh, and uh, this article from uh, Kathy Knobloch, Vanessa, right close to you, wrote, uh, this is outside. And I know Debbie had a great experience uh, uh, on her strawberries outside, but she has put it in a publication from seed germination to handling. So that'll be a very nice article. So look for that uh, in the newsletter, please. Uh, Justin raised his hand. Justin. Ah, unmute. There we are. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, Michael, I, I, uh, I, I, um, I just think that I should uh, mention that uh, Haiku, and uh, on behalf of, uh, of course, yourself and Ina's uh, uh, long, long uh, history of uh, operating um, such a wonderful uh, facility, um, is now uh, known to be the first greenhouse in Canada to be filmed and to be using what's called the media strip plug um that uh that was just done today so uh congratulations and uh it's super exciting and um you know obviously uh this product is is uh, being heavily utilized in europe um in uh being well tested in uh, places like california and um and we did our first batch today other than we had a few test ones earlier but uh, but we were cameraed today on it so that yeah. was very exciting yeah yeah. So, sorry, what is called Justin again? Uh, well, in Canada, they're trying to name it uh, the Media Strip. And media. in 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 um, in uh, the Netherlands, they have it uh, called the Upturo plug. Hmm. And basically, what it is is a, a sus it's a sus uh, suspended substrate glued into a cavity that you can mechanically move and transplant, um, which is first of its kind. Oh, that when you're okay, okay. Right. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's right, last, last week, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's very uh, similar to... Um... Yeah, because I, I would like to have a one page article on that. So who will do that, Michael? <laughs> Just to... Well, we could, we have some video and I, I think that once they professionally made the video, you know, right, then right. It, it would be, it would be worthwhile sharing, you know. 
right. So yeah, yeah. we can uh, we you know so so it, it it's it's very cool because uh, you know a seed like uh, uh, Justin transplanted uh, tomatoes today, mm. and uh, you know the, the the seed is seeded into this tiny little plug, yeah. and yeah. Uh, it's it's much like. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's peat moss with, uh, with a binding agent, so it stays in a little cube yep. and uh, it can be planted much the same as the unrooted cuttings that we use uh, through the same auto sticks machine. And that's what makes this machine so great because it can yep. plant yep. unrooted cuttings, but it can also uh, plant these things right into the finished tray. So it, it's, it's a real cool concept. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, um, okay. So a couple of questions here. Um, uh, somebody's having some terrible mechanical, uh, some terrible uh, uh, ex experience with the air intake shutters. They're flapping horrendously in the wind, and uh, it has been windy in the last couple of days. And they're asking if what we're doing to keep them closed. My first question, Beth, is you know, isn't the motor that opens and closes these shutters isn't it keeping it shut no it's not it's like the springs are really light duty so the wind just gets up underneath of it and flips the um shutters themselves we've had them pop off their pins and everything oh. so we actually we put boards over them and close them and use the door for air intake yeah that may be what what you have to do because if the spring is too tight, then uh, you know the little motor that drives them to open won't won't be able to overcome the strength of the spring. So in in the winter time, you know most people cover them with plastics so that there is uh, no air intake, and you might have to do that for a little while longer. And if it's not windy, Beth, uh, do, do they then stay put, or are they also rattle if it's not windy? No, they stay put if it's not windy. Okay. Yeah, and I think... so and they they seem to stay put if we can get them open in the wind, but getting them open so that the wind doesn't catch them is difficult. And then trying to close them again for night, right? You're fighting with it because it just wants to take them flap. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know if anybody has a, another suggestion for Beth. Um, okay. So then uh, Vanessa's. Uh, oh, I, I want to interrupt for a minute. Go ahead. Um, Beth, I had my, my big intake fan, um, the wind was so hard gusted one time that it actually broke the weights off inside the fan and the louvers had, um, froze open. So I just shut them all in and plastic them and use the roof only for venting this time of year. Um, cause I have a, I have an open roof on that hoop house, but, um, I don't think there's a way to win with the wind. Other than using a door instead of a window. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you want to make sure that they close, you know, because I mean, it, it's surprising how much heat will escape even at night. So, so if they stay yeah. put, you know, at night, if there's no wind, but like, uh, like you're saying, you know, use the door, you know, in these extreme conditions, so. Yeah, we just took the chlor the polycarbonate we cut out and put it over top and then board it up over top of that. Mm -hmm. And it seems to be working. At least they're not getting damaged. Right. Anybody else have uh, something to share on that? Uh, the next question is, Vanessa said, I use the 32 sheet pots and tray. I don't have that many of each kind. Vanessa, please explain. Uh, it's for, you were talking about tags. And oh. so when it, how they do it. So I take the, the, the 32 sheet pot thing that you can cut up into little squares because we don't have as many tags as you, we just have, you know, one tag for each variety instead of oh. a couple hundred. I just, I organize them alphabetically and then uh, I can find them next year. And I mean, right now it's a nightmare because every time we plant something, we just throw it in a container, but we have a way to organize a lot of tags. So I think we can, well, 32 trays or trays of 32, at least we can get a couple hundred in a spot so and you know, then it's save. You know, sorry go ahead no and then it just allows us to save tags like when you send us extra ones for celery i keep them <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what about but are they aren't they top heavy don't they fall out of the pot 
No, because the 32 inch tray, even for the, the ones that you, like the fat tags, not just the skinny gym slims or whatever you can get from Hortocraft, yeah. they come up about uh, at least 60 to 75 percent of the tags so they don't fall out. Oh, they don't fall out. Okay. If you jam enough of them in there, like if you order 200 of one variety, like we ordered 200 Roma tags last year, you shove them in there and they don't move. So oh. they do stay in. The fat tags, like the doom and orange tags that are a little bit wider, uh, they have to fit in on an angle because of the just the width. But I just can't handle them in rubber bands that keep breaking every year. <laughs> so, or we've only been open a year, but they all broke this winter. So <laughs> that's why I did that quick change. Okay, thanks. Yeah, tag, tags are indeed a, uh, you know, a nightmare, you know, because, uh, I mean, they, the last couple of years, they haven't arrived on time or, um, you know, you get all these tags and you're only using a few of them because you're, you're planting the plant in a hanging basket. And, and now, you know, what we should do, have a contest of what we, what we can do with the extra tags, because everybody hates to throw them out because they're so nice and colorful. But I, 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 I challenge Sean to come up with a creative way, you know, to use up all those old tags. You know, maybe we can make a, you know, big display out of it. Maybe we can make murals, uh, murals out of them, you know, in the, in our local town, you know. So, <laughs> so who knows? Um, uh, Sandra saying that she purchased two Wonder Waters, and one of them has uh, some issues with the little water shutoff valve. Those little water shutoff valves, Sandra, aren't the highest quality. Uh, and uh, yes, they can be used. Personally, we take that little shutoff valve that's in between the metal part and the plastic uh, uh, filter part. We take it out and we use one of those DRAM, uh, 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 one, one touch, uh, one touch um, uh, uh, valves, you know, to open and close it. We don't even use that little plastic thing in between because it has such a short handle on it that it's even hard to open at the best of times. Hopefully that helps you. Okay, I have those, good. good. Yeah, I would just take that little one right out, you know, then in between. So Anna suggesting already, Sean, here's your first suggestion. Maybe we can have a, uh, you know, a, a, a tag swap. We all take them to the convention in November, you know, and then uh, you, uh, you leave a tag and take a tag kind of thing. <laughs> okay, all right, Mirza. Anything else? Yeah, thank you very much. We are reaching page 55. Uh, really appreciate that. Uh, keep up the questions coming in between. Pictures, please send. Uh, and uh, don't be afraid. Uh, if I share, I, I generally share your pictures without your name. Uh, but always appreciate that you trust us and uh, we'll keep on working with the industry. Uh, and as usual, Michael, always thankful to you. Debbie, always sharing, caring, appreciate that. And uh, you got your tooth removed and uh, no worries uh, on that. You will heal pretty quickly. All right, uh, anybody else a question? Uh, then we will sign off then. And the recordings will be available in a couple of days. I'll, uh, as you have not, yeah, go ahead. I just had a question about water. Yeah. Uh, we had to shut off our RO system, empty the tank and restart because we were having an algae problem. Yep. And our, we cannot turn on the well water right now with the system. So we're 100% RO water. So I'm noticing, of course, a slight, uh, a little bit of acid makes a big difference because we have nothing in the water. It's yep. just, you know, the minimized. Is there anything I need to add? Because we generally use Nature Source or 17517 fertilizer. Is there something else I should be adding into the water at this point, uh, just to like bicarbonate or anything? Uh, yes, to very good question, great idea. Potassium bicarbonate at 0.1 gram per liter. So just calculate the liter. That will give you 60, 70 ppm of buffering, which we were originally calculating. So 0.1 gram per liter of potassium bicarbonate. Oops, Zero point one gram. Get... That's that's yeah. not a lot. That's, no, that's not tiny. a lot. That's sixty ppm. Yeah. So, but if you have got a thousand liters, then uh, uh, what about? It will be ten grams, hundred grams. What you calculate? Zero point one gram per liter. How many so liters do you have got? We've got a twelve hundred liter tank. 
पचास ट्रम हंड्रेड टाइम जीरो पॉइंट वन होप कोई कम विद द आंसर कोई कोई hundred and twenty grams per liter exactly <laughs> or per tank do i dump per it tank, in the yeah. tank yeah. or do i um do i use it the injector system uh, if you could add in the tank uh, that would be good idea it'd be better because you might otherwise get uh, you know an, an adverse reaction between the fertilizer and the um, uh, you know and the potassium bicarbonate so if we're continually restocking the tank because we're on well water so it like yeah. when it goes down it keeps going up how do I measure what's going on with the bicarbonate? Do I just guesstimate when to add some more? Yeah, just just as to guesstimate, absolutely. Yeah, even or, a little bit higher is not going to hurt anything. Or or you use your you turn your float system off, and yep. you wait till the tank is like three quarters empty. Right. Then then you can calculate much better how much water you're going to add, yep. and then calculate it based on on that so just right. it'll be yeah. a little bit more work but you know turning your tank on and off manually might might work the best during these uh, trying times okay and then where do i find potassium bicarbonate or oh, you don't have it no i don't it just this just happened uh, like last week early late last week yeah no everybody must have a bag of potassium bicarbonate handy for no, what we will do for ph control uh, Michael, do you have any sitting which Lisa could borrow from you? I, um, yeah, I do. She doesn't have to return it, you know, 120 grams, you know, but <laughs> yes, <laughs> we probably have some sitting here somewhere. But where would I normally purchase it? Is it just through like one of the chemical companies? Yeah, exactly. I'm a professional gardener or generally they all carry it. your fertilizer company. Okay, sounds good. But uh, be careful. The powder is uh, quite, quite aggressive. Yeah, it caustic or? Yeah, it's caustic. So wear a mask when you're uh, when you're because it's it's quite dry and quite fluffy, yeah, yeah, you know. Right, so uh, don't yeah. let it get in your nose. Okay. So I should wait till we're done. Like I should because we use that water for everything. So absolutely. when we're just like wetting pots down, I don't want to dump it in yet. Yeah, absolutely. You use it constantly. Yeah. Okay, you so you, you want it. you want to use it too when you're watering when you're wetting pots, you know, because okay. yeah. Because otherwise, you know, the uh, the pure um, um, the pure RO water will actually start eating away at you know metal fittings and and all that. Kind of, it'll yeah. take the galvanize off because yeah. uh, believe it or not, that water is is hungry. What they call hungry, so it'll 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 absorb anything that's in its way. So even when you're watering pots, you're going to want to make sure you had the the potassium bicarbonate in it. Okay. All right, take care everybody, 9 p.m. Thank you very much. We plan for an hour, go for two hours, and that shows. Uh, have a great, good night. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you, Mirza. Yeah, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.